Okay, so our next speaker, Michael Clear, was also a uh, Barney Rosenberg person who is a postdoctoral fellow in the early 70s. He is currently a consultant working with several U.S. universities where he specializes in tech transfer, patent licensing, expert witness activities. And today he's going to tell us about the development of carboplatin. Sorry? Oh, there it is. you can all hear me. I thought for a horrible moment someone was going to tell the carboplatin story and, uh, 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 ahead of me there. But uh, So are you going to put my slides up on here? Yep. We're changing laptops here. Okay, and how do I move it? And what do I push? This? No? I was afraid of this. Should I push this? No, yeah, you, you, you can this okay. Okay, I know how to, I can, I can walk around, which is good. My name is Mike Clear, and I worked here between 70 and 72 with Barney, Barney Rosenberg. Um, and that was a long time ago, as you can see. I thought, I thought that was uh, interesting. I did trim my beard for the occasion. But, um, and I worked for a company called Johnson Mathy, who was founded by this guy. And I only put that up because I wanted to have another old fellow up there as well. To, uh, um, and he founded Johnson Mathy in 1817. There may be some slight resemblance, but uh, that was just to get us off to a cheery start. Um, so I came here um, to Michigan State, which I always follow on the football field and everything. I still consider it to be a sort of alma mater of mine. I was seconded, sent here by my employer, Johnson Mathy, who were a precious metal company, and I had made more precious metal compounds than I care to think about, so it was a good fit to come here and um, work, with, uh, work with Barney Rosenberg. I teamed up with Jim, who spoke to you just now. Cisplatin by now was identified as a potential anti-cancer drug. So we settled down to, um, to look for structure activity relationships. You know, this can't be the only one that does it. There must be something better out there, et cetera, et cetera. We were really lucky because when we started, it was a wide open field. Nobody else had done anything in this area, so that makes it a lot easier. There's a bit of serendipity and luck for us. And I had two very happy years working here, which were the foundation of the, the development of carboplatin. I'm going to whip over these slides because Jim's shown them, but I want to pay my respects and homage to, to Barney and the great mentor that he was to me. And I call Loretta the great enabler. Barney was dreaming the innovative thoughts, doing great things, and Loretta was the steady, enabling hand getting the experiments right, getting the data, doing those observations on the bench that are so critical for those of us who've been practical chemists, um, and a lovely, lovely lady in every sense of the word. So Jim's already told you that we'd found, they had found, that this was all being caused by these wretched platinum compounds. But the only thing I could have told Barney Rosenberg, when I, when I rocked up here in, uh, in August 1970, was that if you pass a current through platinum in a chloride medium, it'll dissolve, because that's how we dissolve platinum in our business. Um, and these things were being formed by uh, photochemistry. So we had, um, I've got a pointer here, which should help. So we had the cisplatin and then um, platinum-4 analog of it. And this is an ethylene di the ethylene diamine analogs, which are simply taking the ammonias and linking them through uh, a two-carbon chain. So that's what we had to start with. And 
I'm going to go through the data very quickly. This is old published data. If anybody wants to copy the presentation, they can. I'm not going to go through lots of T over C and increased lifespan data. But we first looked at, just checked out that charged species in general were a bad thing, and they were. There was no real activity in charged species. All sorts of reasons for that. Membrane transport not being the least of them, but being taken out by other charged species in the, uh, in the body, I'm sure, was one of them. And we looked, we confirmed the cis and trans effect. Cis was active, trans was generally not active for a whole series of different pairs. And you can see up here, um, you can see up here we started with cis and trans platin. And then we started looking at uh, methylamine and uh, ethylamine and then some uh, um, cyclic compounds, propylamine and pentylamine, various others. We looked at a whole load of them and the cis-trans paradox held. Then we started to look at the, what I call the anionic side of the molecule. That's where the chloride atoms are. I put, call them X here. We knew a little bit about this because people had been studying the kinetics of, uh, of platinum-2 compounds. And we knew, roughly speaking, that going up here, you had strongly bound ligands going to weaker bound ligands. So we knew that the reactivity of the compound was probably dominated by this X group. The platinum-nitrogen bond here is very strong. And of course, when we get to all the brilliant mechanism of action guys talking about binding to DNA, you'll find that binding to those nitrogens in DNA is very important because that's a very strong bond. Um, but what we found out was that, generally speaking, you've got activity in the intermediate reactivity. If you had very strongly bound, then those compounds tended to, tended to stay more or less intact in the bloodstream and become excreted. But in the middle range, which was chloride, bromide, um, that was where the activity was. And then when you had the very weakly bound nitrates and um, water molecules, then lots of funny things happened. A, they could be very toxic. You could get tox toxic effects. And B, uh, un under certain doses, then you, they would be active because the chloride ion in the bloodstream would knock out the water molecule or the nitrate molecule or the sulfate molecule and you would revert in fact to cisplatin. So that's, that was the sort of situation with anionic groups. Um, same thing applied with um, the ethylene, looking at ethylene diamine versions. I won't go through that data. Then we also looked at lots of different I reckon I, I reckon I made about 300 compounds in two years while I was here, so there's, I can't possibly talk about all of them. But we looked at, we started to see what happened when you kept the chloride group constant and started changing the ammonia group, the A group. And um, apart from the fact that as soon as you started bringing in lots of carbon atoms, um, then solubility became an enormous problem. Uh, generally speaking, um, if you kept chloride groups on there, uh, you can see from methylamine and uh, ethylamine and the, the lower carbon contents, then you still got activity. There was still activity there. This is a feature of platinum compounds. that There are lots and lots of active platinum compounds against mice. They can cure mice cancer very well. The issue becomes, as we'll hear later, curing human cancer. So we, looked at, we looked, at, looked at lots of different amine molecules, and there appeared to be maybe some steric effects, but basically, basically it was the anionic groups, the X groups, that were calling the show. Um, here are some more um, anionic amine groups, uh, sorry, uh, neutral amine groups, and these are the bidentate versions, variations of substituted ethylene diamines, and then some aromatic heterocyclic ones with two ammonias that will chelate, form a stable chelate to platinum. And this one, um, I think, is that the profile? 1,2-diaminocyclohexane became an um, interesting molecule as it seemed to have some preferential, maybe steric effects. 
But I'm, what I'm trying to get to, and these are some more 1,2-diaminocyclohexane there, and the, um, the phenylenediamine version of it. But what I'm trying to get to is we did all of that, and that left us with knowing that cis compounds with amines and probably chlorides looked, certain amines and chlorides looked to be the sort of sweet spot. And then we did something crazy. We looked at bidentate carboxylate compounds. And um, they started off with the oxalate. So oxalate replacing chloride, a bidentate carboxylate, and malonate. And you would think that those are chelates, they'd be inert, even though the oxygen bonds individually are relatively weak, they're chelated and you'd think they would be strong and that might mitigate against activity, but it didn't. What we found was that um, a lot of these bidentate carboxylate compounds from oxalates through malonates through substituted malonates all had reasonable T over C is tumor over control. Um, and some of them had reasonable solubilities too, which I'll come on to. And they had decent dose responses. So that had Jim and me scratching our heads a bit, I think, thinking what was going on here. But this is a very crucial, this is a very crucial thing. This is the scientific method. No sooner do you think you're onto how this thing's working than you do something that makes you think that you've got to reevaluate that. And I guess in retrospect, it's fairly obvious that there was some sort of ring opening going on inside the body and that these carboxylates are, are sort of pro-drugs, precursor drugs to, to a cisplatin type molecule. But we didn't know that. And that's what we found. And um, these are some more results and you can see I'm not going to go through this too much, but generally speaking, there was activity across the board. We focused more on malonates and substituted malonates, and here's carboplatin appearing for the first time, and I'll come on to that. Oxalates were okay, but they had some of them had some funny toxic effects. So platinum ethylene diamine oxalate, for example, caused the mice to climb up the cage, shake like a leaf, and fall down dead. Um, and I say that for a little bit of humor, but also because it didn't sound like something one should be, should be pursuing for, for, for human beings. So we were a little worried about oxalates. Didn't know whether it was release of oxalic acid or whatever it was. But, so we focused a lot more on the malonates um, to have a good look at those. And um, this is the molecule that uh, if we eventually came up with. Lovely looking molecule, isn't it? Especially especially with a few colors in it. And look up there, courtesy of the Aldridge catalog. And here's, here's where another bit of, this, this whole work is full of serendipity. I had been ordering malonates and substituted malonate molecules from the Aldridge catalog like they were going out of style, like there was no tomorrow. And I got a little note from them saying, dear Dr. Clear, you seem to be interested in malonates. How about these? And that their computer program had picked out some that I hadn't spotted. And amongst those was this ligand. Now, of course, my story is I would have got around to it eventually, but uh, <laughs> I got a little bit of help from the, uh, from the Aldridge people. And uh, thank you, Aldridge, and thank you, thank you serendipity. Um, and the other interesting thing was that some of these um, malonates, which you might have expected, well, the carboxylate might add some aqueous solubility, but as you increase the carbon, you'd expect to, you'd expect to lose water solubility. Uh, this notice is grams per 100 mil, but some of these um, compounds, you see, cisplatin wasn't all that all that water soluble, but some of these malonates became more water soluble, which was surprising to us. And in particular, our friend carboplatin, and this is grams per liter, so um, trouble with pinching old data from old papers is you never get consistent 
never get consistent metrics. But uh, in this case, it was really quite soluble and relatively easy to recrystallize from water. I remember that well. So we'd found malonates. We'd found malonates that had water solubility. And I think the interesting thing that we felt about CBDCA in those days, as it was called, was that it had a big chunk of carbon atoms in there as well. So maybe it had some lipophilic as well as some hydrophilic properties. And it was inert. I'm not going to dwell on this. This was a very simple conductivity work that shows that, you know, if you put it in water, it would hang around for, forever, whereas cisplatin would uh, had a half-life of an hour or so in water as it hydrolyzed. And uh, some of the sulfates and things like that almost instantly hydrolyzed. So it was really inert in terms of s simple chemical reactivity. So that came to the end of the, the Michigan State era. We published a couple of large papers that I've put here, Jim and myself, all of this, all of this stuff. And um, we took out a patent on the malonato platinum compound. This is an interesting example of what um, research corporation and companies do. The actual patent was first filed in 1972, June the 8th. Remember it well, checking the proofs. But finally, it was refiled again. Um, that was abandoned. A, a continuation was taken out, refiled again in 1977 issued in 1979. That's how they increase the life of patents. I've done that many times myself. I can't complain. And it was even subject to a re-examination and a certificate issued in 1989. And once again, if you search around all of this, you'll see that this was a, all relates back to 1972. But now we've got a direct claim to 1,1-cyclobutane dicarboxylate diamine platinum, which is carboplatin. So we have a really strong property of matter, composition of matter pattern, as opposed to cisplatin, which I think Jim mentioned was a use pattern. Those of us who work in drug, have worked in drug discovery know that there's nothing better that a pharmaceutical company likes than a composition of matter pattern rather than a use pattern. So phase two. Clear goes back across the Atlantic and returns to Johnson Matthey, where I set up a, a fairly sizable, I think six or seven people, internal research group focused on platinum analogs. But I think the most important thing um, was that I managed to meet up with uh, some people you're going to see in a moment that have been mentioned uh, from the Institute of Cancer Research in the UK and various others, and with Funding from Rustenburg Platinum. I wonder why Rustenburg Platinum would fund a platinum project, but uh, they also funded me to come over here as a postdoc. So, but with funding from them, I managed to set up a multidisciplinary, multi-center group, which I think was Andy Thompson's here. I think was relatively unique at the time as a, as a freewheeling mixture of people working on a common subject which was furthering platinum. And this group continued till around 1978, 1979, so from 72 to 79. And then a guy called Ken Harrop, I'll talk about more, replaced Tom Connors, another man I'll talk about a little bit more. And Ken decided that the time had come for a more selective and primarily less nephrotoxic. People forget how nephrotoxic cisplatin was and how emetic it was, how horrible it was for the patients who got emesis, and how many people refused to take their second and subsequent doses. It was a wonderful drug. It did a lot of great things, but it wasn't very nice to take. And he decided that I don't mind whether it's the same activity. I don't mind whether it's less potent. What I want it to be is the same overall activity effects and less toxic. And the ICR in 1979 carried out what I call a shootout of promising compounds. And that's what we'll talk about. Um, that's where Carbo came from. Um, oh, I never like to talk about myself, so there's a quote. <laughs> Found a quote. 
Sphere set about setting up the Rustenburg Platinum Group. Um, and this is the Rustenburg Platinum Group. So many important, so many lovely friends and people. Um, the Institute of Cancer Research, Tom Connors and Ken Harrop, sadly deceased, but wonderful people who, who made such a contribution. Uh, the, the lovely, uh, lovely man, John Roberts, and, and many others from the Institute of Cancer Research. University College, Professor Tobin and, and, and his co-workers. I'm so pleased that Andy Thompson's here from East Anglia because he continued the work that he'd been doing over here by coming over and helping us not only on chemistry, but particularly, I think, by then, Andy, you were more on to how does this work. Um, Brunel University, Travis Slater, Mechanistic Studies and Toxicology, and Birkbeck College, uh, Peter Sadler and his group, Chemistry and Mechanisms. And last, but by no means least, the man who's going to talk after me, Hilary Calvert, at the back of the room, the wonderful oncologist, Eve Wiltshaw, were working on clinical studies. But all of these people met together at regular intervals to have a freewheeling discussion about where we were going, changing one another's research objectives, what to do next. I can only tell you that in terms of quality research collaboration, those seven years were, for me, a wonderful experience. And they led, in my view, to carboplatin and all the good things that carboplatin has done. So, two of the big heroes, Ken Harrop, uh, who, super, who followed Tom Connors as the head of drug discovery at the, at the uh, Cancer Research Institute in, um, in the UK. These guys, as Andy Thompson mentioned in questions just now, these guys, after Alex Haddow, picked up the ball and ran with it, did a lot of testing on platinum compounds, and then made that pragmatic decision that let's get a less toxic one. Because what we really had on our hands was not structure activity. Jim and I were totally wrong. It wasn't structure activity. It was structure toxicity that we were looking at. The structure determined the toxicity. We weren't, if there were activity changes, and I'm sure Steve Lippard's going to tell us there, there are activity changes, um, but they're subtle compared to the toxicity changes. And um, this is, uh, these are the two people I was talking about. One's at the back of the room, the, the great Hilary Calvert, Eve Wiltshire, Eve Wiltshire. I wanted to put her there. We were the, the three of us having a chat after Carbo got launched. Eve did a comparative study, key comparative study between cisplatin and carboplatin, clinical study. But this guy took carboplatin all the way from phase one to approval. And he's at the back of the room, he's talking next, and I call him Mr. Carboplatin. Uh, it's easy to make a compound. It isn't easy to take it all the way through the clinic. And he did some wonderful things. And without his dosing formula, which he'll talk about, and I don't want to talk about because I... Without his dosing formula, cisplatin would not have been a success. So he was a young lad working in the ICR, the clinician who picked up a new molecule and thought, goodness knows what, proto what uh, barriers and <laughs> protocols that he had to go through to make all this happen. He'll tell you. But without him, there would be no carboplatin. The other guy was Ken Harrop, who I managed to find a picture of him actually pointing at a uh, drawn out uh, formula of uh, carboplatin and quoting his famous statement, which he put in his paper that he published, uh, he published in the 80s. Uh, and you can all read it. I, I put it in my abstract. Um, that there was need for a selective and primary, less toxic, less toxic version of cisplatin. Can you still hear me? I'm conscious I'm going in and out of it. Um, so he set up a lot of comparative studies, really big. This, is the, this was the key study. A lot of anti-tumor testing, including xenografts, immune-deprived mice. And in fact, that's probably the reason 
there were two compounds that shone in these studies. One was called CHIP, which was a platinum-4 derivative with isopropylamines and chlorides in the square plane and OH groups in the axial positions. Uh, that was called CHIP, and, and there was carboplatin. And they were very close, and it was probably this testing that uh, decided it in many ways for, um, for carboplatin. Lots of toxicity studies. I, sh I, I will touch on the, B, on the blood urea nitrogen just to show you how bad cisplatin was. Histopathology and uh, the, the nuclear protein phosphorylation, which shows that there was cell killing going on in the tumor, but relatively little going on in the liver and the, and the kidney. Now, I've got, I've got these data, and I'm going to flip through it because I don't want to waste your time with it. I'll just show you the compounds. We started off, of course, with cisplatin as a control. We had a dichloro isobutylamine platinum 2. We had a hydroxy malonato compound. We had carboplatin, the cyclobutane dicarboxylate. We had a platinum 4 with the hydroxies in the axial positions, and this is chip, and the isopropylamine in, in the ring, in the square plane, sorry. And um, we had a, an ethyl malonate. malonate. Uh, here's a ring compound in here, a cyclopropylamine, platinum-2 with the chlorides. And then we had uh, a chloroacetates in the, in the ring along with isopropylamine. And finally, this was a compound, I think it was Joe Birchner who was, who was playing with this one, a sulfate. Uh, this, was, this was a diamino cyclohexane in the... Um, in the A position, and a sulfate over here. And we believe the formula was one sulfate and one water. And um, we put that one in as well to show that we weren't just looking at compounds that we had focused a lot on. So those were the compounds in the shootout, the last shootout. Um, I'm not going to sh this shows that some of them, um, including cisplatin, took a heavy toll on the animal in the early days. And if they got through that, they were OK. But heavy toxicity in the early days. Um, here's the BUN data, for example, and you can, you can see the percentage of control for cisplatin was huge, whereas most of the other molecules we found were significantly less toxic in that regard. And I've asterisked JM8 to make it easy for us, 112% um, and no, no deaths. So, I mean, it came out well there. Uh, histopathology. Um, in, the, in the kidney, there was some capsule of thickening, for, for, but nothing like the necrosis that you got with cisplatin and some of the other, some of the other molecules. There were, and, and JM8 was pretty good on the, uh, on the, on the hemotox as well. I'm not, Obviously, it wasn't quite as good, but these numbers are never absolute. Um, against the ADJ, the therapeutic index for CIS was 8.1. And here, here's the two closest competitors in here, CHIP and carboplatin, doing very well. Um, and this was against the, you can see, against the um, xenograft tumor, no deaths. Very good tumor over control. Um, carboplatin excelled in that particular regard. And if you look at um, JM8 in, in phosphorylation, those phos enhanced phosphorylation tests, a lot was going on in the tumor in terms of cell kill, but compared, to, um, but not too much in the in the kidney and the liver compared to control. So um, it. it it was living up to its billing as being much less toxic. Um, and then I just summarized here against a whole load of different tumors. You can see very effective um, either, if it's T over C, low is good. If it's increased in lifespan, high is good. So, so it really had activity against a lot of different transplanted tumors. And that's good because a lot of our early work was all done against S sarcoma 180 and Swiss white mice and 
Then if you looked at another system, it didn't show the same results. But here, here we had a wide range. So, carboplatin was chosen. The Royal Marsden Hospital took on the trials. Hilary Calvert, who's on next, led the trial and he shepherded carboplatin through a successful phase three. With little help, I have to say, from the licensee, he'll tell you more about that. Bristol Myers, Bristol Myers weren't keen on carboplatin at this stage. They wanted to keep the revenues flowing from cisplatin, I think, and they saw carbo as a, as a problem. He'll, he'll tell you about that. I had a lot of successful interaction with Bristol Myers, and I don't want to say anything bad about them because it all worked out well in the end. But, uh, you know, business and, business and pleasure sometimes sometimes get into <laughs> cross purposes. Hillary did great innovative work. My talk was about serendipity. I've pointed out some serendipity. Um, and here's the innovation, innovative clinicians. Here's an innovative clinician at work. He'll talk to you. That man at the back of the room is one of the most innovative clinicians you'll ever meet. Carboplatin received regulatory approval in 1986 in the UK. How am I going for time? Right? Just, so I, I won't show Carbo again. I just, want to, I just want to say something about my company. We did all the IND chemistry in the NDA packages for carboplatin. Lots of chemical techniques, measuring impurities, providing, providing the methodologies, force stability, hot and cold. We put up a manufacturing unit to make it. We filed a drug master file. We built a GMA plant and a lot more to make sure that it would get approved in the UK. That was our pilot plant. Not, doesn't show very well, but research chemists dressed up doing something that they were paid up for. But um, Meanwhile, Bristol Myers, the licensee, back in 1980, eventually licensed that Malinato patent I showed you. On behalf of JM, I negotiated an exclusive supply right of carbo, for carbo patent to BMS. So we then not only did we build a pilot plant, we went then, then went on to build a, build a big building, and we went actually into the pharmaceutical material supply business um, on the back of the platinum drugs. That's a quick summary. You've seen all of that. I won't say anything else except we had a launch ceremony in 1986. I was lucky enough to give the opening talk, and it took place at my alma mater, Imperial College, and it was opened by my former professor, Jeffrey Wilkinson. So that was all lovely. Great. That was, that was me. I can hardly believe I look like that. Uh, that was again. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about third generation drugs, but we did do some work on it. That's the building we put up in West Deptford, New Jersey, that makes a whole load of uh, controlled substances, makes fentanyl and, and methylphenidate, for, for that matter. You can't see it all that well. But this created a whole new division of John Somati called John Somati Pharmaceutical Materials. We bought McFarland Smith, who did opiates up in uh, uh, Scotland. And this is, that's their old, where they extracted the opiates. And this is the John Somati building. Um, so now there, are, now there are three platinum drugs on the market. I'm saying nothing about oxaliplatin. That was approved much later. I think Steve will say something about that. Um, and that's used for colon cancer. That's why it became, came in, along with five fluorouracil. Um, I won't say anything about that. We did, very proud of this, the Institute of Cancer Research, the Royal Marsden Hospital, and John Samathy got the Queen's Award for Technology in 1991 for this, for this work. And I got very fortunate to meet, the, to meet the Queen. And by the way, you have to call her ma'am rhymes with jam. And they give you a piece of paper to tell you that. <laughs> and um, why did I, why, when I retired from Johnson Mallory, 19, when I was about 54 years old, why did I go into tech transfer? Because of this. It was the great, it, it, when I look back on it, the greatest fun I had was being in the middle of the, all of this, being an enabler to help make carboplatin happen. Uh, the great work was done by Hillary and other people, but um, it was great work, and that's why I ended up going to Columbia and then University of Pennsylvania in tech transfer. And thank you. So we're
running a little short I'm on sorry. time here. That's fine. Uh, do we have a pressing question right now? We'll also have a break very soon, and we'll have plenty of time to, to mingle and talk. But in the back, a question? Sorry. Oh, right here, sorry. Um, two very quick questions. Sure. What are the solvent acronyms, S, S, S? Oh, so S is saline and sli saline slurry. Okay. Um, we did some funny things with these insoluble compounds, and we would put them in as a slurry to see if we could get them to work. Sorry, no, no, I, no I'm problem. taking this old data, and I haven't got time to explain yeah. it all. And it's a great question. Okay. And quickly, was that the Wilkinson? Of, you that know, was the Wilkinson. Okay. Great man. Mike, clear. If you ask a question, it's requested that you identify yourself first, please. Yeah, Franco Muggia. Yeah, I, it was a pleasure to see, to revisit all the structure, toxicity relationships. They're very interesting. And I just have a footnote on CHIP, the hyperplatin versus carboplatin stories, not just in the mice that carboplatin outperformed, but when it was the largest phase two study ever done was uh, a, a gynecology oncology group study of hyperplatin versus carboplatin in cervical cancer. Yes. 200 patients in each arm. Was that Roswell Paul? Uh, no, this was a gynecology oncology group it, okay. and uh, sponsored by the NCI. And in that study, the response rate was about the same, but there's no question about the toxicity. Hyperplatin uh, chip was made, a, chip was made a, people sick, didn't chip, it? Yeah. It, Nausea, Literally, vomiting, yeah. not tolerated by women. And that, that goes to the tolerance, again, of, of cisplatin and carboplatin. Cisplatin is very poorly tolerated by women. It goes to the, to the excellence of Ken Harrop and his group that they put together a series of tests that actually got it right, too. Okay, let's thank Michael once again. Thank you.